Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Trevor Smith Miller. I'm the Communications Manager with the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, or CCSN. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, it's going to be a very fantastic one, as I'm seeing so far. If you're new to our webinar series, uh, CCSN is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about the complexity of our health system, connect with others to plan action, and act on those plans to create better outcomes and healthy survivorship. Uh, please visit our website. You'll find plenty of information like news events and also what we're doing uh, in a lot of our different spheres, including uh, with Cancer Can't Wait. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, and a link will be provided by the email you registered with after it has been posted. Now, we will probably have a quick Q&A session at the end of this webinar, uh, but if you would like to save time, you can put your questions in the chat function at below at any time so that uh, we can get to reading those as soon as we can and that uh, we have questions for the end of the piece. Now to uh, talk a bit about our presenters. As a CEO of 360 Public Affairs, Bill Dempster implements highly impactful health policy, government relations, and business strategies for clients in the health and life sciences sector. For over 20 years, Bill has drawn on deep business, legal, and government experience to help clients find mutually beneficial solutions to complex regulatory, reimbursement, and policy problems. Bill previously worked for Pfizer Canada, a member of Parliament, the United Nations, and major Canadian law firms. He is fluently bilingual and has degrees in history at King's College, University of Western Ontario, Law at Queen's University, and a Master of Arts in International Affairs, Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Carleton University. Bill was also called to the Bar of Ontario in 2002. He is joined by Jerry Jeffcott. He is a senior associate with more than 30 years experience addressing a broad range of health and pharmaceutical policy issues at the national, federal, and provincial levels. He is a recognized expert and commentator on market access and reimbursement issues, uh, having been a mentor, trainer, and reporter at different times. He is also a facilitator and coalition builder, playing key roles in helping groups of pharmaceutical companies address specific policy issues in the oncology and rare disease environments. He is the co-author of two Council for Continuing Pharmaceutical Education courses, Pharma School of Market, Market Access in Canada and Healthcare in Canada, and he contributes regularly to IQVIA's strategic information publications, including the Provincial Reimbursement Advisor and Pharma Focus. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bill and Jerry for their talk, Exploring the Cancer Treatment Reimbursement Journey in Canada. Thanks so much, Trevor. Really appreciated that introduction, and it's uh, it's great to be back uh, doing a webinar with uh, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. It's been uh, a few years. Uh, we were we used to do this on a, on a pretty regular basis. So uh, thanks to Jackie for uh, tapping us for for this one. She said that it had been a while since we had done a review of the uh, the, the full system between Health Canada. Uh, approvals and uh, patient access, and a lot has changed since uh, since we've done that. In fact, we're involved in a lot of different things uh, regarding improving this pathway. As you can see, we've got our first little graphic there. Is it, it's a bit of a winding road, and uh, the roadmap to uh, patient access or, or funded public patient access to uh, new medicines and cancer. Um, it is often uh, an odyssey and a real challenge. Uh, the good news is there's lots of opportunities for uh, individual patients, uh, patient leaders and patient organizations to get involved uh, along with your care team. It's not you alone. Um, it's uh, the survivor network as a, as a real representative of, um, of patients and, and leaders. Uh, uh, it's also your, your uh, specific cancer therapeutic area group that will be uh, getting involved. And, you know, you can be your own best advocate in, in so many ways. And, and I know that that's what's, um, what, what Jackie and Mona and the team at, uh, at CCSN do so well. So take full advantage of all the resources and the leadership at, at CCSN uh, as, we, um, as you take whatever learnings we bring uh, to you uh, through this. Um, what we're going to talk about uh, or provide you with is an overview of the Canadian Medication approval process. And that's not just Health Canada approval. It, it's actually much more complicated than just when Health Canada says that a medicine can be sold uh, in, in a jurisdiction. In fact, for patient organizations, it sometimes starts a lot earlier and, and we'll, we'll walk, walk you through that. Um, there are a lot of opportunities and issues that are, that are, um, uh, that, that are changing. We're going to try our best to, to make this as 
untechnical as possible. Um, one thing, if you want to raise a hand or, or catch us or zap us somehow, if we use an acronym that you don't understand, uh, we will definitely uh, deserve that zap. So I don't know if, uh, if Trevor, you want to keep an eye on uh, the, the acronym soup that is this, uh, but we'll do our best to blow those out as we, as we move through it, because there are a lot of people who don't know and maybe would never want to know what CADETH is, what PCODER is, what PCPA is. Um, so that's the last time you're going to hear us say an acronym without explaining what it is. And then you're all going to be really experts at the acronym soup. We're going to keep uh, time, as Trevor said, for, for discussion and, and Q&A. Um, I'll pass it over to Jerry to, to lead us through this, although I will tag in from time to time uh, as well. So, uh, Jerry, over to you. Okay, do you want to move to the next slide then, please? Okay, so the first thing that uh, you need to understand about this process is that there are a lot of steps along the way, and each of them um, is complex in its own right. And typically, although not always, these um, steps in the process are sequential that they, they take place one after the other. So, you know, you go through your Health Canada approval, then you go to CADETH, then you go to PDC, PCPA, uh, et cetera. So um, I'll tell you what CADETH and PCPA are in just a minute. But the, the point I'm making here is that one of the reasons why Canada tends to be a little bit longer in this process is because of the sequential nature. And it's something that, uh, you know, advocates have been trying to address, but also the organizations have. And there are some possibilities of some parallel reviews that take that have uh, arisen lately. And uh, we can talk about that as we go through it. So uh, yeah, just to give you the uh, uh, the sense here about what is involved and how long it takes. Next slide, please, Bill. So um, this um, graphic that uh, you see here, uh, we'll break it down, uh, but it really demonstrates the, you know, sort of three year process on average that um, a medicine, um, you know, is uh, cancer medicine is um, faced with uh, upon, you know, sort of uh, submission to Health Canada for uh, its review. And uh, on the left-hand side of the graphic is sort of the public payer um, uh, journey. And you'll see that there are a few more steps in the process um, and versus the private payer uh, process. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of how that differs uh, in terms of how they conduct their reviews and analysis. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's a sort of a more straightforward um, process on the right-hand side, on the private payer side. But I should mention that that's actually changing. The private payers are becoming more sophisticated in the way that they evaluate new medicines. And um, as a result, you know, that uh, it's not as quick any longer, and uh, that's particularly significant in the cancer area because um, a, a greater number of uh, new cancer medicines are being funded through private payers. Typically, in the uh, past, they would have been funded primarily in the hospitals, um, but now um, that there are a whole bunch of um, medicines that you can take, uh, you know, from your pharmacist, uh, there, there's a much greater um, uh, participation by private payers. And again, I'll get into more specifics as we go along. Um, Bill, is there anything you want to add here? Um, yeah, just need... briefly in terms of who has access to a private plan and who has access to a public plan. And mo most, um, most Canadians for first dollar coverage, like your first plan will be a private plan, especially if you if you um, uh, work for a company that offers uh, a drug benefits program, uh, or if you're a beneficiary, or if your kids are beneficiaries of, of that program. So that covers around 66%, uh, about two thirds of all Canadians, um, or around uh, 29 to 30 million Canadians. Uh, the balance uh, have first dollar coverage or could get first dollar coverage from the public drug programs. And then, as Jerry mentioned, you know, in most cases, in many cases, depending on what kind of cancer you're facing, um, the, the medicines will be uh, delivered through the hospital or through your cancer agency, depending on where you are in Canada. Uh, so cancer is a bit different from 
other drugs. And that's just one of the reasons why there are actually two, two systems. In fact, this is an infographic we, we developed um, uh, just for the cancer system. It is, it is uh, very different from the normal uh, medicine system program, especially if you're in Western Canada. And we can talk a bit about that. If there's anyone in the chat wants to us to dig deeper in that, we can do that. Okay, next slide, Ben. Okay, so we'll take a, a crack at the top um, platform, which is the Health Canada Review. And uh, Health Canada has broad responsibility for protecting Canadians' health and well-being, but particularly with regard to medicines, they are the regulatory um, uh, um, officials. They review medicines to ensure that they are safe, effective, and of high quality. Uh, in that in, in that evaluation, price is not a consideration. Um, it's the clinical data that's uh, per, that's um, developed within the context of a clinical trial um, um, framework that uh, provides that that uh, most of that those data, as well as uh, manufacturing um, inspections and things of that nature. So uh, in the context of a Health Canada review, after the product is evaluated and all of those clinical data are, um, are assessed, um, what Health Canada does is it issues what's called a, a notice of compliance or an NOC. And in some cases, when um, a product uh, has come into the marketplace or out of the clinical trial frame a little earlier, and there's still some questions about you know, uh, where the data is headed, they'll issue a notice of compliance with conditions. And what those mean is that um, Health Canada essentially says, we'll, um, we'll come back to you and look for some additional uh, information from you. Uh, but for the, for the time being, you can use it under the certain, the circumstances that we've, um, that we've assessed. Um, there are um, other routes of, um, access to medicines in Canada, uh, primarily through what's called the special access program. Um, the special access program is used for um, products that aren't, that haven't been submitted to Canada, but are needed in the context of an individual specific needs. And uh, they are available, you know, in other markets. So there's a case by case review that says, you know, it, it, this is a medicine that needed for this specific purpose you know, will you, uh, will you provide it? And Health Canada gives yes or no answer on that. They also um, are responsible for evaluating uh, the advertising related to, uh, to medicines, as well as post-marketing surveillance, which is essentially um, examining what's going on in the, uh, with the use of the medicines after they're um, in the marketplace. Um, in terms of patient uh, input, which we'll we'll get into more detail on early uh, later in the presentation, I can say that in this context, there's not a whole lot of uh, opportunity for individual patients or patient groups to um, participate in the conversation regarding a, the evaluation of a submission. However, uh, patients are involved with Health Canada on a variety of advisory committees and are consulted on you know big policy questions. Um, but in terms of individual uh, medicine reviews, there's there's not a, a formal opportunity for patient input. Next slide, please, Bill. Yeah. The other the other um, role uh, of Health Canada is clinical trials. So they'll approve clinical trials that are conducted in Canada, and that's a, a really important opportunity for patients to get early access to promising therapies, especially in cancer. It's 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 huge. So yeah, just point. wanted to tag that. Oh, look, we've got a flying Health Canada. Like, there you go. All right. Um, at the same time as the Health Canada review is underway, there's also a patented medicine price review board analysis. So PMPRB, as this uh, body is known, is a quasi-judicial uh, agency that examines um, the prices that companies are um, planning to, to charge for a new medicine. And they essentially, I mean, they essentially um, create a, a price ceiling. You know, you can't you can't price your product higher than the uh, the amount that that the PMPRB guidelines tell you is appropriate. Um, 
this is not uh, a review that takes that has to take place uh, before the medicine is approved. So uh, essentially what um, the industry does is they set a price, which they think is going to meet the PMPRB's guidelines. And then over the course of time, there's an, an assessment. And if all is well, it goes forward. If not, then there's uh, some mechanisms in place um, that allow the PMPRP to sort of uh, ask you to, to revise your price. So their mandate is to ensure that prices are not excessive. Uh, and that uh, excessive definition is um, reflected in the um, the uh, regulations and the guidelines that uh, PMPRB assesses. Um, they also, um, they also evaluate or uh, that's what I'm looking for. They uh, they also assess whether or not the product is being uh, increased based on a uh, on a uh, an inflation based formula. Um, they they tell you what you're allowed to take in terms of increases on an annual basis. Um, I should mention that the PMPRB is currently the subject of some reforms. Uh, there was a new uh, regulatory frame that was uh, approved in July of 2022. And uh, we're in the process now um, of uh, trying to determine what the next steps are in terms of how the guidelines will change in order to um, meet the requirements of these new regulatory frame. I'm not gonna get into detail unless people wanna ask questions about it. Uh, but once again, in this frame, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for patient input on an individual product price or it's determined the determination of whether or not it's excessive. Any additions, Bill? No. Great. So the next step in the uh, in the journey down the stairs is what we what's called a health technology assessment. And uh, in Canada, there are um, there are several health technology assessment or HTA bodies, but Canada's health technology assessment agency is the Canadian the Canadian Drug and Health um, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Health CADF. Um, so its uh, mandate is uh, in the context of medicines is to review the um, uh, medications that have been approved by Health Canada to provide payers, public payers in this case, with what are called reimbursement reviews. These are non-binding, scientifically based expert recommendations that really uh, determine whether or not, are in, in intended to determine whether or not a drug is both cost-effective and clinically effective. And they do this by comparing the new medicine to existing products in the marketplace uh, through a, ver a variety of methodologies that they use to um, assess the clinical and um, cost effectiveness of the product. Uh, CADF relies on uh, manufacturers to submit um, dossiers with data. Part of the, the data uh, comes from the clinical trials um, information that was provided to, to Health Canada, but there's also, also additional uh, data that is um, intended to address the question of comparative uh, cost and clinical effectiveness as well. And within the context of that, there's um, some formal opportunities for patient groups and clinician groups to participate and to provide uh, feedback that is taken into account when uh, the decision or sorry, not decision, but the recommendation is being formulated. So this is a very uh, complex review process that examines both clinical and economic data, which leads to um, recommendations to an expert review committee. And the expert review committee is made up of oncologists and pharmacists and methodologists, uh, ethicists, et cetera, who are you know, sort of there to provide uh, an, an assessment of all of the information that's pulled together, and they provide that through the uh, a uh, what they call a deliberative review framework, where they assess each element of the data and come forward with a recommendation that says this is something that you should list. 
it's something that you should not list or it's something you should list with certain conditions such as a price reduction or a um, uh, some clinical um, considerations. So as I say, there are formal uh, opportunities for input by patients uh, within this process, and that's a good thing. Um, and uh, there is a uh, the the, the Cadith recommendations are prepared and presented to all of the public drug plans across the country, except for Quebec. In Quebec, there is a similar uh, organization called Ines, and Bill, I'm not going to try and uh, say that out in en français, but uh, if you want to, feel free. The in Institut National d'Evaluation uh, for the, 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 the Service en Santé et Services Sociaux. Right. So there's everything in Quebec has three S's on it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, INES does essentially the same thing as CADF, but it does have some distinctive um, approaches to these things as uh, Quebecers are wont to do. Um, but um, the the output is the same uh, recommendation that goes to the uh, Quebec drug plan in terms of whether or not the product should be um, uh, covered or not and under what circumstances. Um, so, Bill, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, just a really important point, and this is um, there is an opportunity, and uh, in in many cases, um, well, two things. One. Uh, the many manufacturers, especially in cancer, uh, take advantage of, of an opportunity to um, start this process even before they get their Health Canada approval. Right. So you can do that up to six months, I believe, before uh, you expect Health Canada to, uh, to provide its notice of compliance. And it's a, a huge opportunity to collapse that, that, um, that time frame uh a lot more uh so that that's number one uh even if it's not approved you may hear about a patient input opportunity for a drug that's under review right now at health canada and second just in terms of uh where individual patients and a lot of you on the line probably have have you know contributed to surveys already um Cadith opens up uh, a 35 day uh period for patient leaders to basically collect data from their community, uh, you know, in let's say colorectal cancer or head and neck cancer, or whichever, whichever type of cancer we're dealing with, uh, and they will push that out to to their community, and they'll want to know, um, you know, what uh, what the impact of the disease is on your on your lives, or if you're a caregiver on on the family or the person that you're 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 working with. Second, they'll want to know. You know what your experience is with the, um, the you know the the therapies that you've been on to date. Third, they'll want to know uh, you know what your expectations are or your hopes are for how the medicine that is under review will potentially uh, help you. And this is super important uh, um, to be able to get that um, perspective in because, as Jerry said, there are actually four uh, sort of quadrants or, or criteria that the expert review committee will look at. Um, there's the economic data, how much does it cost? What's the budget impact? Actually, that's not even the most important. There's the, the, there's the clinical data. Does it actually work uh, in the way that uh, Health Canada thinks it does or has reviewed it? And does it work in comparison? How does it work in comparison to other medicines used for the same place in treatment for that specific uh, cancer? Second, the economic uh, aspects. Is it comparatively economically more valuable or cost effective compared to uh, um, to what the other medicines are. Third is that patient um, uh, impact. What is the effects on the quality of life? Uh, so that you know, if if it's you know a once a day injection or versus a four times a day injection, or if something can be taken in pill form at home as opposed to you going into the hospital, those might be really important aspects for you to bring forward in the patient input. And the fourth aspect is, will it, how will it actually fit into the health system? Anyway, they, they deliberate, but the, you know, the patient impact is a very important element of that. And that's why I think a lot of the people on the line um, you know, pay attention to that. And there are actually a whole separate webinars that we could do just on, on that. And, and actually, Cadith has come out to uh, the CCSN uh, to, to help run those too. So I'm sure that a couple of them are on the line. They might, might, they might take the opportunity to ping Jackie and say, hey, can we come again?
Sorry, sorry to take up so much time, Jerry. No, no, it's good. And, and Bill, I should mention too that Inez also has a formal patient and clinician input opportunity as well. Again, slightly different than the way that Kenneth handles it, but it is done um, in both cases. And the uh, another key point is that individual patients are not um, eligible to send in their input. It has to be done through a, a recognized group. But we'll cover a little bit more of that later on. So uh, let's go to the next one. And um, and hopefully people are um, addressing any questions uh, in the um, chat uh, that they want us to um, to uh, provide more detail on. Um, this slide, you're not, I, I, there's no, there's no uh, quiz on this. This is just to show you how complex the uh, HTA review process is. And you can see that there's several phases and within each phase, there's a whole host of activities that take place uh, over the course of the six month, typically six month time frame that a uh, CADETH or uh, NS uh, review um, is in, you know involves. So I just wanted to give you the sense of of how complex the um, the process is and and why it, um, potentially it takes a little uh, a little while to do. Um, I'm ready to go on to the next one, Bill. Okay, the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance or PCPA. So once a CADF and or NS recommendation is made. That recommendation is passed on to a, a new agency that's been created on behalf of all of the jurisdictions in Canada that conducts um, product negotiations. So uh, you, you recall, I talked to you a little bit about how the PMPRB um, assesses and sets what we call a ceiling price, the, the price that, you know, the, the maximum price that can be charged in Canada. However, that maximum price is almost never what the payers, uh, the public payers or the private payers uh, actually pay. And the reason for that is because of these product negotiation processes. So this Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance Agency um, has been created in order to uh, bring all the, the public payers together. So all the provinces and the federal drug plans come together and negotiate with individual manufacturers on a product by product basis as the submissions move from recommendations from Ines and Cadeth into the PCPA framework. So PCPA um, you know, gets a long a whole sort of bucket or basket of new recommendations and then assesses whether or not it wants to, uh, the members within it, assess whether or not they want to negotiate um, price with the manufacturer. And when they determine that, then they send a letter and say, okay, we're ready to have a conversation. Um, and typically what happens after that is that one jurisdiction is assigned to do the negotiation, the back and forth on behalf of all of the other jurisdictions. And then they, they keep the others informed while the negotiations continue. And if a deal uh, can be reached, then a letter is um, written that says, here's what we've all agreed on. That letter then um, gets uh, um, provided to all of the um, all of the jurisdictions for follow-up, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But just a quick note here to mention that um, there is no formal opportunity for stakeholder input into these negotiations. They're, they're you know, sort of one-to-one -one, uh, PCPA uh, manufacturer um, conversations and uh, the agreements are confidential, but the, uh, they do typically result in fairly significant, um, at least 30% uh, on, you know, would be sort of my sort of best guess in terms of um, uh, discounts or uh, rebates that are provided to the payers for um, off the the uh, the retail price of the medicine. Um, is there anything else I want to say about PCP? Uh, and yeah. just just to just to note that that that's. Most jurisdictions around the world are actually doing this. Um, you know, almost every insurer in the United States is is doing deals. Uh, um, all of Europe are doing deals individually, and some of them are actually getting together to negotiate. Uh, and it's really important to 
um, have that opportunity because we're right beside the United States. The U.S. is actually trying to import our prices or even our medicines. And so uh, if there's not an opportunity to have that, that higher public sticker price um, and then negotiate down from there, uh, it would be very hard actually for manufacturers to be able to sell into Canada at that lower price without having an effect on um, uh, other much bigger markets around the world. And so this, the whole concept of these negotiations has actually come together, together over the past almost 20 years. Um, and the PCPA is, is, is actually become its own uh, spin-off agency uh, in Canada. We can talk a little bit more about that later, but I just wanted to, uh, to explain, you know, why do we have negotiated prices uh, in, in Canada? Because it seems a little bit uh, wonky. One thing I will say, though, it's about 36% Jerry on aggregate. Um, there are public reports in terms of the total value of the rebates going back into plans. And we can work work back from that in terms of across the whole country. And yeah, it's definitely in the mid thirties in terms of uh, the price off of the the public risk list price. Yeah, actually, Bill, I would argue that it's probably more than that even at this point. But I, you know, it's just that there's no data, uh, or there's very little data. So you know, and my sense is that it's actually getting bigger the discounts as we go along, yeah. but uh, because PCPA is becoming more aggressive and better at uh, at their negotiations. Sorry, so. Next step in the process. So, you, as I said, PCPA has, uh, you know, sort of created these these uh, um, terms that uh, have been shared with all of the public payers across Canada. They then talk to the manufacturers about what, how they're going to implement those terms within the context of their um formularies uh and um and uh, cancer um agencies uh, uh plans etc so that's done through um you know a conversation that takes place after the pcpa um uh, terms have been negotiated now we, they're not supposed to actually change the actual terms or the negotiated arrangements they're only supposed to uh, build um, something that meets their specific administrative requirements. Uh, so there should be no difference in terms of what, it, you know, typically ends up on the formulary in terms of the, the uh, coverage for the product, except that it has to sort of fit within their framework, uh, you know, which individual jurisdictional frameworks. Um, now, some provinces uh, conduct additional HTA reviews. Generally speaking, they don't, re-review things that have been done at Cadiff and Ines, but there have been instances where they do. Typically, their additional reviews are for medicines that don't go through Cadiff and the PCPA process. Um, every province in the country um, adds those medicines that, they, that they've agreed to to their formularies. But in some cases, they put them into what are known as special or exceptional access programs, where the, the specific criteria related, and this particularly uh, applies to cancer medicines, where the specific uh, um, indications or uses of that product are defined even further within the context of how medicine is um, is practiced in that particular province. And those would typically re uh, re require a case-by-case -case review, um, especially if the product isn't listed but needed for a specific uh, patient. Um, all of these provinces offer what are called catastrophic prescription coverage. So if you're, uh, you know, a senior and you're... Uh, or a uh, social assistance recipient, anything that's listed on these pro on these formularies or lists of covered medicines, you would get uh, coverage. But if you're not on that list, then and you're you know you need cancer treatment, uh, you, there is some uh, coverage opportunity through these catastrophic plans, and these are um, typically based on how much of your income. Uh, you're spending on prescription medicines and uh, uh, you know if you reach a certain percentage after which you've paid you know your share then the province would come in and and provide um, some additional support in um, 
in Manitoba, it's about 3.2%. Uh, in BC, in uh, Ontario, it's between 3 and 4%. So each province is slightly different in terms of what when that sort of kicks in. But um, the, 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 um, they all have uh, some mechanism to help you with um, your costs if, if um, they go beyond a certain percentage of your income. This is for um, medicines that are administered outside the hospital. In a hospital, medicines that are administered in the hospital are fully funded by the public health care system or through what we call what we typically refer to as Medicare. So you're if you're in the hospital, your medicines are covered, whether they be for cancer or for other um, treatments. And um, you know, those are all uh, free of charge. Uh, again, however, even within the hospitals, they do make decisions about what they'll cover and what they won't cover and under what circumstances. And those uh, decisions are usually made at the regional or local levels um, within the hospitals or within hospital groups or within a regional health authority. Um, and they'll decide what they'll, they'll cover and what they won't. Uh, within the context of these conversations, there are some opportunities for stakeholder input, not typically on an individual product, but um, there are some opportunities. And as I say, we're going to talk a little bit more about patient input opportunities or stakeholder input opportunities a bit later. Bill, I, I, I covered a lot of ground there. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, just to, just to say that we've got the infographic there and the Western Cancer Agencies, generally the, those three Western provinces will cover everything related to cancer. So your anti-emetics, uh, uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting medicines they will be generally covered through the cancer agencies like pills you name it it's all done through those organizations once you get um uh, east of uh, saskatchewan it gets more complicated and it's a real mix between hospitals public payers and they also have ca cancer agencies in in several of the provinces that that have play a coordination role uh, but it is it is quite the mix of of who pays for what where, uh, and just knowing that uh, you know where you live, um, the the system may be and function differently is uh, is pretty important. The, they will all start from, however, for public funding from the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance negotiated deal. So that sets out the the, the core criteria. So what's ended up happening is there's actually a lot of concordance across the entire country in terms of who gets what where the big question is often when so some especially Atlantic provinces um, have a lot less less uh, fiscal room or money uh, they end up uh, actually listing or or, or um, uh, reimbursing or providing funded public access later than a lot of the other provinces uh, in, in central Canada um, and just keep that in mind. They all have the same sort of term sheet for, you know, uh, how to fund the drugs or under what circumstances, how much rebate they're going to be getting. One of the big issues with uh, with PCPA is uh, is timing for when the individual plans actually make their decisions. Yep. Okay, so uh, uh, that last bit was about the public payers. Um, and as I said, increasingly, uh, because of the nature of how cancer care is being um, uh, you know, provided in Canada, uh, a, a greater number of uh, treatments are being provided outside hospitals. So, you know, you go home, you get your prescription, you, you, you take your medicine there. Um, so as a result, private payers who traditionally haven't had a big role in covering cancer medicines, have have started to take a much much uh, bigger role, and in fact, uh, you know, we've had um, uh, recent indications that in some uh, in some private plans, cancer medicines are one of the top um, uh, claim areas, uh, which is uh, a new phenomenon uh, that has really developed over the last. Uh, you know, within the last decade in any case. Anyway, these are plans that are typically offered by employers, associations, and other groups, but they're provided by big health benefit providers or, or uh, what you would think of as insurance companies, Sun Life, Blue Cross, or, or Canada Life. Um, the coverage of under the private plans is usually uh, based on a standard plan template. So each, 
each employer essentially creates their own private plan based on what they want to cover. But those are usually based on some kind of a template. Um, and, you know, customization, you know, takes place. But generally speaking, you know, if, um, you know, if it's, if it's something that most of the um, insurers or uh, providers are providing, then it's going to be covered. Um, typically in Canada, private payers um, make their reimbursement and coverage decisions earlier than public payers. Um, now, as I said, that is changing as they've been taking a greater responsibility for both cancer medicines and other um, higher cost uh, treatments. And so Private payers are beginning uh, over the last several years to build more, um, more uh, complex, more sort of sophisticated review processes, and as a result, uh, have been introducing more limitations within their formularies as to what's covered and what's not. Um, so these these plan design tools that they're encouraging um, or sort of developing are really designed to manage their costs. And sometimes they do that through the imposition of annual or lifetime caps on coverage through a managed formularies, essentially, uh, which limits, uh, the, you know, what they will, will cover and what they won't. Prior authorization programs, which are things like, you know, uh, you, you need to sort of send a doctor's uh, explanation as to why you need the medicine and get that approved by the payer, um, et cetera. Some of them are, in fact, waiting for CADF and in as recommendations before they'll list the product. Um, but as I say, this is a relatively new process, um, uh, but it is growing in, um, in both complexity and sophistication across the private payer marketplace. Um, and because, you know, traditionally they haven't really had as detailed a, a review process, they, there aren't a whole, um, there aren't formal patient input opportunities the way that there are um, in the uh, CADF and INES systems. Um, so it is something that um, that you know is developing, and perhaps that uh, that will evolve later. But um, currently, it's not the case. So, on to you, Bill. Hey, thanks, Jerry. Um, just a, another note to uh, to participants to use the chat panel. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, ask us anything. And if we don't know the answer today, uh, we we do have a pretty big team here, actually, and we can uh, we can get back to you on that. In fact, I, I see some some of the folks on the line as participants, and there are some experts uh, among the delegates today at, at CCSN, too. So um, may, feel free to make the chat actually interactive among yourselves uh, as well. I want to talk about a few other issues and opportunities uh, for for cancer patients to get access. And I mean, if if you're if you're listening to this for the first time, or if you were, I don't know, somebody from Moldova who landed here and said, you know, I'm facing cancer now. What do I do in Canada? And then they listen to this presentation, they'd probably say, What is this system? It's so complicated. And and the answer is. It, it is. It's uh, the system to actually provide, uh, to assess and provide access to medicines for, for cancer and for other drugs in Canada is often, um, uh, you know, uh, very complex. Uh, in some ways, it's, that's a function of the fact that um, cancer itself is very complex. Uh, blood cancer is different from a solid cancer, but it's actually meant, and actually each health system are their own separate health systems in Canada at the provincial level. So, each of them do have other access pathways, even beyond the ones that we showed you. Uh, there are specialized provincial funding programs. Um, for, for instance, in Ontario, they've got ones uh, focused on new and emerging cancer therapies uh, to be able to provide faster access to, um, to, to, to new cancer drugs. There, there's sometimes opportunities through hospital foundation funding or uh, the hospital formularies. Well, they're, they're going to make a decision provide access to, um, to, to a medicine that isn't normally on the approved um, provincial formulary. It doesn't happen all the time, but what I think you'll find, and again, a lot of people on the line are probably um, in the survivor category, is that your oncology team will say, hey, we wanna try you on this medicine. 
In fact, it might work really well if we combined it with this other medicine. So it's no longer just one drug at one time. In fact, a lot of these are being used in combination. So really rely on your on your oncology team to uh, to understand what's best for you and, and when. Clinical trials, we mentioned that earlier, a very important opportunity for, for you and families to, to get access to, to medicines that, that may save your li life. And it's not just the, um, the individual new drug that's coming online again, uh, they may be um, uh, putting you on a combination of, for instance, uh, immunotherapy, where they're going to actually uh, trick your, uh, you know, uh, a lot of cancer cells hide from the immune system, and therefore the, their own immune system does, doesn't attack them. Well, some new um, class of drugs, especially uh, immuno-oncologics, they unmask that. They make the cancer, uh, uh, you know, apparent to the uh, uh, your own immune system, which can attack it and, and really either put the cancer at bay to treat it. And there are some really good long-term outcomes in there. Those came to Canada first through through clinical trials, which is such an important way for, for folks to get access. And don't worry if you're on a clinical trial and you, you know you think, am I on the on the um the, you know the old drug that we don't, you know, we or the new drug, if uh, a manufacturer finds that or, or a, a trialist finds that it's really working in, in patients, and this can be even a matter of weeks. There's almost an ethical obligation to move everyone onto, onto the new drug that really shows a lot of progress and promise. So keep an eye on clinical trials. Health Canada Special Access Program, um, if, I, if I recall correctly, uh, you know, probably about a decade ago, uh, Revlimid for, for um, uh, multiple myeloma was only coming to Canada through the SAP. It was a huge, huge opportunity for, for patients with, uh, with, with uh, that blood cancer to be able to get uh, early access. Those last for, for six months and they have to be reapplied by your, uh, your treating clinician, um, but it is a very important way to get access. One of the challenges with SAP is that it's not often publicly funded. So uh, you may be able to access it through your private plan, but uh, even more likely, and in many cases, the manufacturers will be providing those medicines uh, on a compassionate basis for free, but not always. Um, but SAP is, a, is an important um, way to get access to, to medicines that are available and approved in another jurisdiction globally. So Europe or the United States uh, or Australia and actually get them shipped here. Uh, and then there's like I said before, the manufacturer funded compassionate access programs and patient support programs are often very critical uh, ways to be able to get um, uh, affordable access to medicines. And it's not just about the, the affordable part of it. Sometimes these patient support programs um, will, will actually help you navigate all of the, uh, uh, the challenges that we talked about earlier. Uh, um, throughout this, when you are getting access to, to new cancer medicines, you're going to be asked to fill out um, surveys and other things to, to let folks know how are you feeling, how is it working. Your, your clinician is going to be building out that out that data. So you remember when Jerry was talking about the, the notice of compliance with conditions to collect more data? Sometimes um, when you're on a new product through some of these uh, access pathways, you will actually be contributing to, to those ongoing um, uh, research programs to actually demonstrate uh, whether or not this drug is working for, for you with, uh, with that specific um, cancer. Anything else, Jerry, on this one? No, you're on mute. The universal sign for you're on mute. Yeah, I just want to let you know that we're, um, we're running a little close to the uh, time. Okay. I want to give you a chance to ask questions, so we should run through the other ones. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate the time check. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the challenges I would say is that the CADIS, the Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, is actually providing recommendations on specific price points for the public payers, uh, and they're using uh, this the concept called the quality adjusted life year. So, how much should a public payer pay for one full uh, year of normal health? Uh, using these methodologies, uh, they come up with with um, a price point recommendation to decrease uh, off of the public list price that's very specific. And it, it's it's actually over almost overnight, uh, about a year and a half ago, they started using um, $50,000 per quality adjusted life here. If the public payer pays any more than that, 
then they would say it's not cost effective. We should put that somewhere else in, in the health system. What it's actually led to is many drugs in cancer coming out with, they wouldn't be cost effective with any price reduction. You could, you could give this away for free into the healthcare system and it wouldn't be um, useful because it would actually take away from somebody else in the healthcare system. This is something to keep an eye on because it's, uh, it is an issue and we can maybe talk about that more um, in, in the discussion later. Um, you know, all of this complications within the, the health system in Canada has actually led to uh, a fewer number of medicines being submitted to Health Canada for review and then going through what I affectionately call the paddy whack machine before it's allowed to be used in terms of publicly funded in, in Canada. And I'll, I'll leave this slide for the slide share and whatnot. And I think I have to actually update that, that point on the top right. So for slide share, I'll, I'll update that, um, uh, that, that database. But a lot of drugs that come and are available through the FDA have actually not even been submitted to Health Canada for approval. And this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, it, you know, we can't just rely on special access programs and other regulators to, to review these medicines and, and hope that one day they're going to come here. In many cases, they're not coming here at all, um, in part because of uh, the, the complex system that we've, uh, we, we've talked about. Yeah, other issues really high level um, that are flying across the screen now. Um, you've got more alignment between CADF's two main um, uh, programs. One is, well, actually there are more lines of lines than that, but they've got the common drug review, they've got the, the, the pan-Canadian oncology drug review. They're becoming much more standardized, whereas cancer system used to be very separate, uh, uh, often clinician driven, uh, now it's it's really one line, one important line, a, a program that Cadeth runs, but it's it's very similar to how they uh, they handle uh, the common drug review as well. Um, they have a new organization, an organization structure uh, at Cadeth. Uh, they are certainly um, growing and uh, and evolving. They're interacting and collaborating with Ines, which serves as an observer on Cadeth's board. Um, I think that's often a good thing because sometimes um, we end up with recommendations coming out at different times and it can make it very hard for, for public payers to know when or, and in which cases to actually uh, reimburse a medicine. Um, real world evidence is a, is a buzzword RWE, uh, but it's very important. Uh, and like I said before, you'll be contributing to that through some of the surveys that you're going to be doing when you're getting access to these medicines. That's real world evidence that's that's what it, what's it doing in in uh clinical practice very important to be able to figure out where and when and how to use these medicines and and um funding algorithms and diagnostics i, I won't go into that but there is an opportunity for patient leaders to be involved in, in terms of place in therapy uh questions that cadeth and the hta system will have um it gets it, it, jerry the uh the slide you showed with uh with the, all of the steps yeah, there's, there's another one on, in terms of funding algorithms that can be blown out as well. Um, yeah, it's actually part of the HTA process, but it's but it's at the end, so it's uh, it does extend the. Uh, the well, actually, uh, they're yeah. trying to move it up and make it all part within the six months. But uh, um, basically, it's the question is for this stage of cancer, which drug should be available there, and if we fund the, this the, this new drug coming in. Does that push other drugs out, or do we add it to, you know, the available drugs for 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 that specific tumor type and stage of cancer? Um, PCPA uh, and the Patent Medicine Price Review Board are are actually involved in some global discussions as well in terms of negotiations. And then very recently, the PCPA is incorporated and spun out as a, a not for profit corporation like like Cadeth. Uh, and that's just something to keep an eye on. Uh, it was a uh, part of the Ontario Civil Service, and now it's spun out as, um, I wonder if we're going to have to change that acronym soon, uh, but who knows? That's it. Questions in Q&A. I see the chat lighting up. Thank you. Oh. I see Louise and Chris. Jerry? Yes, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, we, we haven't got a, a whole bunch of questions, but uh, happy to answer any that you might have. But I can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, start uh, by by answering the first question that uh, was raised, which is um, additional information on how to access the manufacturer funding through its compassionate access programs. And 
typically uh, the answer to that question typically is that um, you know that would be done something done with your uh, oncology team. Uh, you know, I guess you'd go through the process and, and, you know, more often than not now these days, patient navigators are helping you through the various uh, review process to determine whether or not your product is covered under what circumstances and what needed, what you need to do if it isn't. And one of the things that you can do if it isn't is um, apply to one of these compassionate access programs, but uh, that would be done, you know, with your oncology team who would, um, would help you manage through that process. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Richard, uh, you got your hand up. Do you want to, I don't know if you want to get elevated to a speaking role, but let's see if the mic works. Go for it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, I have a, a, a complicated, uh, somewhat uh, political question, but uh, it's not meant to be critical. It's meant to be identifying a problem. And I have to give a little bit of background. So I do psychosocial research in both prostate and uh, breast cancer. Uh, and a lot of my work focuses on language and how we understand language. Um, and um, uh, I know that CADF has reached out to uh, the survivorship, the Survivor Network, Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, uh, for advice and counsel and feedback from patients. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the word survivor is not uh, uh, accepted by all people treated and diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and in fact, prostate cancer patients typically don't like the term and they stay away from the word. As a result, not, not out of any conscious effort, uh, the CCSN does not represent prostate cancer. And this, this becomes very serious because some of the most valuable and most uh, useful drugs that are coming on market are for prostate cancer are outrageously expensive. Uh, and then with medical students, we published a paper on why they're not likely to get cheaper. These are many radio ligands, for instance. Um, and uh, we have a problem. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't know where the CADF knows that you guys aren't reaching the prostate community. Uh, now, I want to say a few things by background. I run a national program to help patients uh, manage the side effects of their drugs. I'm funded by the drug companies, five of them. They produce some of the most expensive drugs out there. In fact, they produce probably the most expensive drug, one of the radial ligands, one of the theranostic agents. So how do we collectively, and I know Trevor's listening in on this, how do we get to, to either have an organization which has survivor in its name uh, be acceptable to patients who sh shy away from that word, who feel like I've got to get a PSA test for the rest of my life. I'm not a, I'm not a survivor yet. Or a breast cancer patient who's on stage four and, and going for recurrent uh, you know, chemo doesn't like the term. In fact, we have a, a paper we're just finishing off right now looking at who accepts the term survivor. And even the, the group of patients that accepts it most are breast cancer. But even then, about 15% of them, depending on where they are in treatment and their history, don't like the term. The term is exclusionary. And this Rich, Richard, just to... Just Briefly interrupt because I want to get to a couple of other questions now. Uh, I'll show that, But no, I want, how are we going to solve that? Our, yeah. our, our, our bill, we, have a, we can have a private conversation. But this is a major issue because these drugs aren't going to get cheaper and we need to be able to reach the prostate cancer patients. Yeah, my, my, my dad had prostate cancer. He's had a prostatectomy. He doesn't, I, I tell him he's a survivor. I invite him to events at, at, at Queen's Park and stuff like that. I don't tell him he's a survivor. I say, come to the event. Uh but it's, it is a real issue. And in fact, even the word patient is, is controversial sometimes. People want to be people. Uh, so person-centered health. I know, I know language is so important. And uh, I'm sorry if anything that I and how I framed it might have clanged. But I really appreciate uh, these conversations. Let's take this offline. And oh, yes, please. I'd like to. Oh, yes, please. It's important. Yeah. It's really important. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm, if my dad's listening, uh, yeah, I, I got <laughs> you, buddy. Um, you know, a couple of questions in, in the chat uh, around the cost per quality. How does $50,000 per year of a normal life compared to other developed countries with public payers? You know, there have been um, reviews of what TADF and, and the Pan Canadian Oncology Drug Review uh, used to use as a, as a general threshold. It never really had like a, a dollar figure put to it, but it, the, the, the closer number was $100,000 per quality. Um, and you know the fifty thousand per year. We we have an idea of where it came from, 
Uh, it actually came through um, a study done for the, the PMPRB when it was actually thinking about using thresholds in price regulation. Uh, and yeah, the, there is you know public outcry about you know how, why, and where of of cost per qualities, and it's it's a it's a huge challenge. Um, well, in fact, Bill, just to be clear, I mean the qualities in themselves are problematic, you know, and in particular they are problematic for uh, products with small patient populations. So, I mean, the threshold is is questionable, and you know, there's been some ongoing debate back and forth about that. But even the the concept of a quality, you know, makes sense in a broader patient population framework. So, uh, you know, a population based approach to analyzing these things. But as medicine becomes more personalized and more sort of specific to particular genetic, you know, uh, abnormalities and things of that nature, the quality sort of frame is completely inappropriate for evaluating uh, cancer medicines. We really do need a different approach and Kenneth uh, hasn't yet sort of come to that conclusion. So lots of big issues around quality that need to be addressed. Yeah. I mean, we've actually done whole webinars just on, on the quality. So uh, uh, put a, put a pin in that Chris, your, your point about disparity and listing on, on cancer drugs for private plans and the differences can be greater if a patient works for uh, I should say a beneficiary works for a small business the takeaway there is to, to you know to learn more about what your what your plan covers uh, if you if you work for somebody that actually offers benefits. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a really good point. Uh, Colleen wanted to know what EVP stands for. Uh, Executive um, Vice President. Ex ex well, exceptionally uh, volubilous person, I think. Uh, no, yeah. Executive Vice Vice President. This is uh, um, the cadet has a new structure with it with a new. Uh, Executive Vice President uh, that, that's helping um, manage uh, the, the, that growing organization. Um, yeah, is there a comparison made between new drugs, alternative means of treatment, i.e., surgeries, therapies, suffering, et cetera? There is actually. Um, you know, when a, when CADIF or Ines review uh, um, whether or not to recommend for public listing. They really do look at all the different um, uh, alternative, uh, like therapeutic options. It's not just comparing to other drugs. They're actually looking at, you know, uh, um, what what if we did surgery in this case at this stage of cancer, um, and they, you know, would that be more cost effective or clinically effective if we if we did that? And suffering, that's where you know quality of life really comes in, and of course that's very important for people with cancer. Um, uh, to understand what the potential effects are. And then I guess we have time for one more question, Trevor. I know we're we're way over time. We we have a little bit more time. We've allocated a little bit more time because again, of this uh, that, that type of topic, there will definitely be a lot of questions and the chat has been definitely filling up. But if you would like to take a couple more questions for that, we definitely have the time. Yeah, yeah so, I think... Oh, sorry, Bill. Yeah, no, I just wanted to address this one around genetic testing and, uh, you know, when that would become more mainstream. And, and that's actually a really important question, but one that I don't have an answer for uh, specifically. I can't, I, mean, I can't tell you when, but I can tell you that it's something that, again, that the cancer system and the healthcare system, broadly speaking, need to, to come to terms on. Currently, there's no sort of dedicated budget or even a, a review framework for uh, genetic tests or for um, companion diagnostics that are required in order to sort of assess whether or not the patient is going to, you know, benefit from a particular medication. And that is something that the system needs to address um, because it's going to become more and more commonplace. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a serious problem at the moment. Yeah. yeah right. it, that's actually increasing the times to get access to, to, you know, the best therapies right now, like the, the pathology and the diagnostic systems here in Ontario are backed up. So they may actually start a, uh, a cancer patient on uh, older chemotherapy while they're doing a biopsy and, and, and running a, a review on the specific cancer. They may get you started on, on, you know, something else when if we can deal with some of those backlogs uh, in diagnostics, um, there's a real opportunity to get get patients uh, on the right drug faster, for sure. Yeah, we really do need to standardize that whole process 
of um, you know when is the genetic test going to be conducted under what circumstances who's going to pay for it all of that has not been addressed and and needs to be standardized both privately and publicly uh, within our system yeah. um one final question something that actually i was asking mean to ask you guys uh so in the past couple of months, and especially because healthcare has become so front and center as a as a topic in the country, we've seen the the talk about the increase of the of uh, the amount of money that the federal government's giving to the provinces. We've seen the uh, patented uh, uh, prices medicine review board and how they are trying to change. Uh, they want to change things up. How about things about how, how they do? And then there has recently been this major announcement about how. Uh, the, for rare diseases and disorders that the federal government wants to put in a whole bunch of money into finding cures for these um, for for these uh, for these disorders. Now, the fact is is that it seems that there's a lot of push to uh, change these kind of this this framework that you've uh, put through with your presentation. Is, do you feel like in the past couple of years since you last talked to CCSN, has there been a change in the appetite to to change the system or are we kind of seeing uh, not necessarily business as usual but just different approaches to the system uh, for this kind of uh, stuff in Canada? Yeah you know Trevor since 2016-17 so much of the like the the discussion and the challenges have actually been around that patented medicine prices review board and um, how has it changed? What is it going to do to the rest of the system? How would it interact with health technology assessments? Um, and I'm I'm hopeful that that you know that that issue is starting to get somewhat resolved and normalized. Although there's still a lot up in the air there. But I, one of my you know flags, and, and I've said this in other forums, is that you know while everyone's been focusing on on that the rest of the system has either become more complicated or has not been subject to a lot of um, policy reform or, or attention that, that organizations like the CCSN would be raising. So I really think, um, you know, the, 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 that it hasn't changed fundamentally or sufficiently, um, you know, in a way to improve access to patients, uh, we, you know, or people who are at risk of getting cancer as much as it could have been over that that same time period. At the same time, people who really wanted to see the changes that were proposed to the P, uh, the PMPRB, they thought that this if we did this, this will solve everything else because we're going to get lower lower prices. But as we've seen, focusing on like lower public prices, you know that can have an impact on when the medicines come to Canada, if at all. Uh, and and so yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that we're we're on a on a, a better path to. Um, real reform, and I actually can see that uh, some of those um, those things are coming through at, at Cadiff. Uh, one example is they're you know they're looking at more managed ac access pathway support, like they're going to do time limited recommendations that would allow potentially faster access. Look, the uncertainty is there. Here's what we know about it for now. We recommend this going on the market, but let's let's re, re review that or look at that in maybe six months time. Um, Health Canada's you know doing their best to have agile reviews. And you mentioned the, the big funding announcement yesterday. I was in Montreal because uh, I do so much, we do so much with rare disorders too. It was big. It was such a great um, opportunity for the federal government to, to you know, push out more funding to get access to, to new therapies and, and diagnostics. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the door is definitely open for, for new ways to do things. That's now, now's the time. Unfortunately, we, we've had a lot of time, uh, the pandemic, uh, that took everyone's energy for for the better part of, of three years, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll learn the lessons from the pandemic in terms of the need for for um, timely access to therapeutics and diagnostics and 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 apply those to to solve cancer. I know uh, what was the the name of the um, cancer can't wait or some of the other systems that you're you're running right now the campaigns, Trevor. We we have cancer can't wait, which we are uh, we are going towards uh, to, to governments and saying that you know cancer care didn't need to stop that we want to continue cancer care and get access to that care that has been interrupted because of the pandemic and also bring the concerns of cancer 
patients and survivors to the uh, to people to the people in government to make sure that that care is maintained. So yes, we uh, our cancer can't wait advocacy. Uh, we have been doing quite a lot, and there is a lot of uh, that we are going to be doing in the next couple of um, months too. So keep your uh, ear to the ground about that because it's coming very soon. Um, if that is all, I would like to thank Jerry and Bill for a fantastic talk, very comprehensive talk about HTA in Canada, and I would love to have you guys around again, but thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, now, this is just one in a series of our webinar series for 2023. Uh, we have one coming up in a couple of weeks. We also have um, our, our other webinar series of Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor, which you can also find all that on our website. Now, don't forget to subscribe to our email chain. Uh, if you're not seeing your email in the inbox, there is a, uh, a lot of emails and there's changes to Google. Check your spam folder if you want to get the latest, if you think that you're not hearing anything from us, but uh, just please tell people to subscribe to our newsletter to find the latest and greatest about what we're doing here at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Uh, and once again, all of the webinars can be found at survivornet.ca. You can find them all on demand uh, through our YouTube service. Uh, so uh, with that, thank you very much to Jerry and Bill, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Have a good day.